25 miles, Angel 6. Roger, that's the only one I've got right there where the pointer is. there and welcome back to the DCS sit rip where we discuss news and information about DCS world the world's premier combat flight simulator I'm your host prickly hedgehog let's dig into the newsletters from Eagle Dynamics which were dominated by a news about the new Normandy 2 map which I showcased last week this is a brand new map remember from Ugra media and includes geographical areas seen in the two separate channel and Normandy maps but expands on them significantly. Most notably, we now have detailed renditions of both Paris and London, but we also have much larger portions of both the English and French coastlines, which should better represent the historic period. I've always thought that the two maps should have been one, and with improvements to the game engine, it seems Ugra has led the charge to combine the regions, which saw some of the most intense aerial battles of the World War II era. In addition to cities and expanded towns, the team will continue to add more airfields and I have been impressed with the large number of natural, historical and fortification features the map entails. The Monsul sea forts are a real highlight and contributed to fending off mine laying activities by airdrop, anti-aircraft and flying bomb defense during the period as well as incursions by German fast boats. Steel plated structures remain on red sands and shivering sands in the Thames estuaries. The structures apparently providing inspiration for the Star Wars Imperial Walkers, which is pretty cool. A dedicated team is trying to restore some of the remaining forts which were briefly occupied in the 1960s by pirate radio station operators. Guy Monsal built other concrete structures as well which were floated and sunk into place to protect these important coastal features. One of the more famous is Navy Fort U1 which was seized and turned into sea land to form an independent nation which still exists today. I must say I've barely scratched the surface in terms of exploration you probably saw Nine Line and I doing some stunts under the Tower Bridge, but there are, as previously mentioned in the other video, a massive array of features as well as a plethora of airfields to launch operations from. It will be a rich playground for historical mission makers and campaign makers looking to overcome the limitations with having the region split over the two separate existing maps. This is a huge improvement. Some of you were questioning the validity of this map given that we already have historic maps of the era for the region. But I think this map does what it should have been from the outset, both portions of Normandy and Eastern England. So the question remains about additional aircraft and assets to embellish this map now that we have it. Honestly, we'll have to wait and see whether we get more German or British aircraft. There are a ton of aircraft that we need for the World War II period and as yet, we are still waiting for the Corsair for the Pacific Theatre, which will be a nice addition to the World War II version of the Marianas, which ED is working on as we speak. So there's a lot to look forward to in terms of assets and things, but of course we do need more to really increase the immersion and increase the interest in the World War II period, which is not everyone's cup of tea. I have enjoyed it though, and I am looking forward to getting into some of these World War II aircraft and exploring the map a little bit more and taking some time to see just how much work Ugra has done and thus far I've been very very impressed with the map's details. Now speaking of the World War II theme, ED also ran a mosquito livery competition recently and revealed a series of winners from that competition. This will embellish our mozzie outfits to take out and about while exploring the map and that fabulous fighter but as I said before I'd love to see some other twin-engined bombers uh, there was talk of the Lancaster as well, so there's lots and lots of things that we could uh, wish for and uh, if there's any developers out there looking to tackle the World War II aircraft in DCS World, there isn't a better time to do it with this fabulous map. So stay tuned, we'll see what happens in the future. 
Now, while the map hasn't dropped officially yet, ED did drop a massive patch last week, which featured major changes to most of the aircraft in terms of updates, bug fixes, and additions. Newer aircraft, like the Mirage F1, for example, received extensive changes, including fixing the darkness in the cockpit, among a plethora of others. And the F-14B saw a major overhaul of its flight model to more accurately represent the mighty aircraft's handling characteristics across a range of flight envelopes, which is really good news. A core area of improvement from the ED team, though, was continued tweaking of the core engine for multi-threading performance. I'll post a link in the description below for that changelog. It's just too massive to go through piece by piece, but it's worth looking at if you have a particular aircraft you're following development on, uh, seeing how it's progressing. And as described, most of the aircraft did get changes, some more significant than others. Man up, come on, Jerry. personal note, I have embarked on some F-16C refamiliarization now that that aircraft is much further along in development with an Air Warfare Group colleague. And this has been a great way for me to get back into more formalized training processes. The aircraft is a very potent platform, not just in the air-to-air -air performance at which it excels at and is renowned for, it is still a very, very formidable opponent even today in that arena, but it is also equally a devastating air-to-ground platform as well. So it's been fun learning how to fly the aircraft again, getting used to its flight parameters, etc, etc, and then enjoying some of the new features that are being brought into this aircraft as it, along with the F-18, uh, gets closer and closer to release from early access. Uh, both aircraft are some of the more popular in the game, and for good reason. They bring a really exciting option for multi-role aircraft experiences. Now one piece of news I didn't cover last week over the excitement, if you like, of the Normandy 2 map, uh, was the revelation that ED has been rejigging aspects of the venerable Huey UH-1 engine model. Now these improvements, they say, stem from extensive learning and testing from other engines in the game, including their Apache and Hind models, which of course are absolutely superb. Helicopters are really becoming a force in DCS world and bring new experiences to flight for fans of, of low-level knife work. Now the old engine parameters did not match the real world counterpart, especially in transient regimes they described. The team have made adjustments to temperature regime compliance. This includes exhaust gas temps based on ambient temperatures and altitudes. They're going to improve the modeling of the mechanics of the free turbine and main rotor connections. And all of this work had allowed them to improve the startup and shutdown procedures that leverage the expanded modeling of compressors and free turbine. This is good news. Uh, a lot of people enjoy the Huey, but did complain about some of the realism to do with the flight model. So we'll wait and see what that generates in the game and how it functions. I don't own the Huey, so it might be one I need to pick up and play with. Uh, I've really been enjoying helicopters lately in DCS World. I think it's a lot of fun. And with some of these new maps, as you've seen, like the Sinai, uh, and I'm also looking forward to the Kola Peninsula, which I have been tinkering with too. Uh, we're not ready there, unfortunately, to release any details just yet, but that is uh, a project that's going to also impress, I think, a uh, slightly different kind of theatre than what we um, have experienced, although it will be, you know, it is essentially Europe-based, so it won't be unfamiliar, but again, a nice uh, addition to the game, and I'll keep you posted where I'm allowed to on that particular development. I've got to give one of the developers some feedback with uh, with some flight, which I haven't had time to do. I took a little tinker with it recently with one of the helicopters, so uh, stay tuned for more info on that. Now, while we're on helicopters, people continue to ask for updates on the Kiowa and the BO-105. Now, the latter is from Miltech5, uh, who teamed up with Rasbam some time back to keep the project alive. It continues uh, to be showcased with exterior and internal rendering work and some new liveries which look pretty promising. There was speculation about the project being stalled or canned some time back. This is not the case. Miltech 5 indicating he was determined to bring a working model to the game despite some support loss from a coder who wasn't able to continue with the project. I believe he now has a coder again and it appears that the work is continuing on. 
and as soon as we see some in-game use of the aircraft and its flight modeling, we'll have a good indication of where the progress is at in terms of a working unit, which is really, really good. Now, if you're paying attention to the Kiowa from Polychomp, this is another aircraft that kind of went off the radar for a little bit because of some internal and personal things going on with that team. However, they have been heavily testing this aircraft with SMEs, including Burundus, who has a channel showcasing using the aircraft in its, I guess, better testing stage or wherever it's at, I'm not entirely sure. But there was a video yesterday of him doing a quick start and flight test demo, which I'll post a link for you all to uh, see for those Kiowa fans. Um, what I'm seeing is impressing me no end. And as I said before, the addition of these helicopters in the game is highly encouraging. It's bringing more players to the DCS World platform. Certainly the Apache is a huge fan favorite. Uh, we'll have several transport aircraft coming to the platform this year as well, which further broadens the player base and roles for those who love combat logistical roles, or scouting roles, which can of course be equally dangerous and challenging. Just ask Casmo. I was talked about his experiences, he's talking to Ward Carroll, uh, being, you know, essentially shot while flying in Iraq. So there's a lot of scope for helicopter work in DCS. And of course, the more things you bring into the game like that, the more you need other logistical things to, um, you know, flesh out the environment. We're talking these new maps that I've already discussed. We're talking more objects. We're looking for more ground units. All of these things, um, have a roll-on effect, which I think is good. It is obviously challenging for Eagle Dynamics, and I know a lot of people get frustrated with the lack of this, that, and the other, and developmental processes and stuff like that. It's a complex, uh, sprawling, if you like, uh, simulation, because it can do a lot of different things, and, and it can mean different things to many, many, many people. Uh, primarily, of course, the player base is solo, um, but for those of us that also enjoy multiplayer, that's where the game really excels. And, uh, you know, uh, I know that Juice from the Air Warfare group is encouraging people to fly with him for war warbirds and stuff like that as well. And if you are able to take some dip into the multiplayer environment, and it's something I've been kicking around in for a while to get people, you know, having that experience, because once you go into that multiplayer uh, environment it's it's uh, the, the game really just enriches itself it's such a mu it's a much more vivid uh, immersive experience than than the solo games can give you and those solo experiences are awesome and obviously the addition of a dynamic campaign is a huge portion of development that we're waiting for and I think that will bring in even more players so you know the future is rich for DCS world it's just a matter of what niche you want to carve out of, like I said, what is a very sprawling, large kind of game because it can do so many different things. Um, and because, too, with the various eras that we're covering, we've got World War II, we've got Cold War, we've got overlapping Cold War into these uh, uh, the modern war with these fourth-gen fourth aircraft. The game is not static uh, in that sense, and that can be challenging, I think, for players, too, to try to get, trying to get to grips with uh, what DCS can offer. So um, it's positive news overall though. And I think this wraps up the core news from Eagle Dynamics this week and what's going on in the game. Um, I'm really looking forward to more work on this multi-threading. I think that's been a massive boost so far for the game. And I'll try to keep track of the other developments that we have as they evolve with third parties, like I've mentioned, Polychop, Miltech 5, uh, Magnitude 3, so on and so forth. Uh, we've got several aircraft uh, bubbling and boiling in the background waiting to uh, come to light. So hopefully we'll get more news this year on some of those other projects. Uh, we've talked about the Chinook, we've got the C-130 coming. So yeah, it's a really exciting time to be involved in DCS World. It's been a really particularly busy time for me too with home projects right now and also training people at work with um, staffing issues that we've had. I also have to attend a lot of training. This month's been booked up just about every week with some sort of training and additional thing that I have to do. So that's really taken up a lot of my time. I'm hoping my schedule will change at the end of the summer and I can slot back into a more Monday, Friday role, but that's not possible right now. And that will bring me back my evenings and weekends and hopefully more consistency with uh, some of the projects um, that I'm working on in DCS World and videos, etc., etc. So I appreciate all the support. We're getting very close to 10,000 subscribers. 
So don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to like and comment in the comment section below if you feel like you want to have something to say about any of the topics that we talk about. I do read all of the comments and I appreciate the feedback, uh, constructive criticism and all that kind of stuff. And as I've always said before, if you want to support the channel a little bit more, there is the super thanks button below. Look for the look for the heart icon. That sounds familiar, um, but it helps the channel chug along. And as we knock on that uh, door to 10,000 subscribers, uh, it really helps the channel and it helps me justify the work that goes on in this uh, particular arena. Again, thank you so much. This is Prickly Hedgehog. We'll see you next time on the DCS Sit Rep. Cheers. Looking good. Yeah, that's it. Excellent. Good. I have a